And back to the Moto G6 I go. I made this whole video showing the repair of this little module here, and I recorded it on the Samsung S6 that I was playing about with. It's an old beat up phone, it's, it's just to try it out. And some incompatibility occurred between open camera and the Samsung, and for some reason I paused while I was recording the video, and when I started it again, when I played it back, it just froze the frame at that point and you could hear me talking in the background and then when I'd finished talking and stopped the video for real it uh, then continued with the video with no audio so it kind of messed that whole video up not the first time it's happened it's the uh, one of the trials and tribulations uh, after recording 1500 or more videos you're going to get a few that just go terribly wrong anyway to this unit in question which is a uh, one Lux Doppler detector, and it's the sort of thing you'd find in uh, LED light fittings and your ceiling in places like public buildings. And this one was faulty. This one was doing this annoying thing where the light just stayed on all the time, except every so often it would just glitch and it would just cut out and come back straight back on again. And it would just do that every so often. Out the corner of your eye, I'd see it cut out and on again. And initially I thought maybe it's just, uh, you know, Maybe it's just something that someone's been moving about in the vicinity and it is detecting other movement. But it turned out that uh, when the unit got replaced, it was this that was faulty and it was falsely false triggering all the time. So I've opened it up and it's using a capacitive dropper. It's notable that it doesn't have a discharge resistor across it. So if you disconnect this from the mains, uh, anywhere near the top of the sine wave, it holds quite a spicy voltage across these wires and you can get a bit of a zap off it. Worth mentioning that, uh, just if you ever do have a wee poke around one of these things, just remember when they're unplugged, they can still give you a little tiny zap. Now, if this was based on, let's take a closer look at it. If this was based on a traditional switch mode power supply, let's focus down onto that as well. Let's make sure it's in focus. If this was based on a switch mode power supply, the components I'd suspect were would be the capacitors around that. I'd be looking for domed capacitors or just dry capacitors. But this is based on a capacitive dropper. Notably, it was on this capacitor here. And uh, these have an annoying thing that the X2 capacitors, the metal film capacitors, they're basically a metalized plastic film and it's rolled in such a way that it provides layers of metal plastic, metal plastic. It's two films rolled together acting as the dielectric and the sort of uh, the conductive layer. And uh, what happens is, and I've, I showed this in a, a video that I recorded a while ago, um, what happens is that the metal film just erodes away from the capacitors. I unrolled the capacitor uh, in that particular video and you could see that the there were big patches of metalization had just vanished and I'll show you what actually happens in that uh, instance. Oh, something worth mentioning about this. If you look at the Doppler detector here or the microwave detector here, um, I'm just going to focus down on, hold on, I'm just going to focus down on here and hold this in roughly the same position. You'll see it's got a metal can at the back, and the metal can is acting as a little cup so that the circuitry is screened from the back, so it only sees disturbances out the front. I'm guessing from the fact there's three connections that the bottom circuit board here will have the sort of the detector circuitry on it. The top circuit board will have the Doppler uh, or the microwave uh, generator will have that little zigzaggy antenna and the transistor inside and uh, that's all that's required it's plus minus power for that lots of decoupling capacitors and then the signal back down to the detection circuitry uh, if we get the capacitor the capacitor the meter in here and i set it to the two megafarad range and we get the original capacitor now the original capacitor has printed on it 564k. What that means is 564 uh, is 564 zeros. It's 560 nanofarad, but this one is measuring 390 nanofarad. So that's the sort of thing you get, and that can even be measured in circuit. In fact, I'll show you. I put a 560 nano in. I didn't even have one in stock of these, uh, this size or type. 
I ended up having to rake through my collection of capacitors out of LED lamps, so I'm not sure how good quality this one is. But if I measure across that in cir circuit, because there's not much in the way of circuitry across it, you can get a good reading. So the 560, it's 554. That's fine. 554 nanofarad. Uh, things worthy of note, the capacitor was annoying to take out because they'd put the capacitor through and they'd folded the leads across and then they'd soldered it. And that's really makes it difficult. You have to try and melt the solder at the same time you're levering the leads up level with the rest that you're going to flick solder. Other things worthy of note here, there is a metal oxide varistor across the mains in this, but no thermal fuse. So that could get quite hot and spicy and... And if it did that thing, they occasionally fail by getting hot. That's shady. There is effectively a built-in fuse, though, just in the track, uh, which if too much current flows in this circuit, the track will blow. But I'm not sure what, that's, uh, what that could go up to if this did fail. Uh, let's power it up. So I've got the Cliff Quick Test here that lets me just connect things quickly, and I'm going to make the circuit board live. And then I'm going to have to hold very still. I've set it to the position with the little light sensor here. It's turned off on the dip switches. I've set it to the minimum setting, sensitivity setting for this. It's this range detection uh, on the dip switches. And I've set the time delay to the absolute minimum. It's not even, it's not even a time delay that's mentioned here. But uh, if you use the uh, all the switches off, it does do a very short, just a matter of seconds. So I'm going to power this up now, and the little green LED will light, and the relay will click. Let's zoom down this so you can see it. So I'm going to power that up. That will light. Click. The relay clicked in more decisively. And now I'm going to have to stop talking momentarily because it detects the movement of my chin. It's that sensitive. Still here. Still here. So that's it turned off now. But as soon as I move my chin, it turns on again. It's that sensitive at this range that it can see the, the chin going up and down, creating that disturbance. That works. So the capacitor I used was just one that I had in stock, but I checked out. Uh, let's discharge that. Yeah, did you hear the pop? That can give you a good zap. I know this because I've had a good zap off it. That happens. Let's bring this in. Exhibit number two. Let's take the exposure off momentarily. Let's focus down onto that and lock the exposure again. So a good example of a capacitor you could use. This is uh, from Rapid Electronics website. It's capacitor, the order code 61-28883. It's a UK company. Uh, and it costs... Unit price, including VAT, is uh, 68 pence. Um, and uh, Rapid Electronics, uh, they give free shipping if you place an order above about £30. It's not that much below that, but that's only in the UK. Unfortunately, they charge a £9 shipping surcharge to the Isle of Man, which is quite annoying. It's worth mentioning that their closest rival, CPC, doesn't charge any surcharge to the Isle of Man, and that's why I tend to use CPC over and above Rapid Electronics these days, which is a shame because I used to use Rapid all the time. They were my main supplier. But I'm kind of getting fond of CPC, even though they have their odd quirks, like the recent order that arrived with everything loose, including drums of cable and glass light fittings. The glass light fittings are granulated glass now. And also uh, I ordered some uh, PolySwitch solid-state fuses, uh, about uh, 20 of them. And I guess that would be two packs and something went wrong in the ordering and got two packets of elastic bungee hooks instead for some reason. Uh, still waiting a response about that. Mm, very odd. But um, you might think, well, OK, so it's only 68 pence the capacitor. But what about the cost of having an engineer fit that? Well, keep in mind that this wasn't just a faulty module. This was in a complete light fitting. The whole LED light fitting was rendered unusable because of this faulty module. And you know fine well that maintenance guys and facilities management companies, they'll get a report of a faulty light fit and they'll just go and rip the fitting off. They'll throw it in a skip or dumpster and they will just put a new fitting up. The 
maintenance cars will do it just because it's just easy, it's less hassle, they get these faulty LED light fittings all the time. The facilities management company will do it just because they make the most money out of that. And, uh, of course, they're not wanting to fix things. They, all they do is just, they're just board swappers, really, effectively, in most instances. So um, they would just swap the whole fitting out. And you'd have the time taken for the engineer to actually remove the whole fitting from the ceiling and put a new fitting up, screw it onto whatever they could find, and then make connections if they could find, hopefully, the same fitting that all the wires reached. So... If you were in maintenance in a, a building that had a lot of fittings with these type of modules and this was the problem, then it would make sense to maybe scrap a couple of fittings or get a couple spare and then when you had faulty units, swap them over but take these ones back to the workshop and then at your leisure change the capacitors and just re-give these ones a new lease of life so that the next time another fitting went faulty, you could take this module along, just swap it in and bring the other one back. It would make sense. It would be ecologically sound and it would become financially viable in a sort of large installation with a lot of fittings of a common problem. Uh, other things worth mentioning here, hold on, I'll get rid of the quick test here because I want to bring up the hoppy. Here's the hoppy. Get ready for flicker. Oh, let's not plug it in. Let's stuff wires in here first. I'll just haphazardly stuff wires down the front of this and there are little speaker terminals that that uh, they use. And I shall plug it in, making sure this doesn't flick off and zap me. The really has energised the hoppy, the flickery hoppy, which is actually less flickery than it was in the Samsung, uh, is showing 42 milliamps. Um... It's worth saying that uh, the apparent power, the, the real power is one watt. It's measuring the power. The power factor is 0.1, which is a tenth of unity, which uh, it's terrible power factor. But keep in mind, this is generating a 24 volt supply from a 240 volt supply by causing a phase shift. And that correlates to the 10 percent there. Um, so if I'll bring in the pink calculator of forbidden truth. I shall type in 0 0.042, which is what it's displaying at the moment, 42 milliamps, times 245 volts, equals the apparent power would be 10, pound, uh, 10 watts. And that means that over the course of a year, this module would cost you, if you were being charged real power, it would cost you one pound to run. If you're being charged a part power because of the way it works, the capacitive dropper, this would cost you £10 a year to run, plus any uh, power factor difference in the LED fitting itself when it was lit. And suddenly you're thinking, hmm, that would add up. People say, you know, the utility companies won't ever do that. Uh, some utility companies are doing it. And uh, it's only a matter of time because the bean counters are the ones who'll make that decision and they'll say, tick that little checkbox in our control software and that's when everybody's bill will suddenly surreptitiously go up by a little chunk. Yeah, it sounds a bit conspiracy theory, doesn't it? But the meters can do that and they will do that. So uh, that's it. It's fixed. All it took was uh, this capacitor being moved, that capacitor being put in. It will clip back together. One of the worst bits was trying to get these wires out of this horrible connector. It's, it's a push-in connector. And uh, unless you've got just the right size of tool to push down gently to release the, the connections, it just uh, it knackers it. Um, but there we go. An easy fix and a very common thing. This uh, sort of capacitor failure happens a lot in capacitive dropper type power supplies. And uh, it's not that hard to resolve uh, with just a standard off-the-shelf component. So a good, worthwhile repair to do.